International Cooperation in Cybercrime Investigations was presented as part of the Cybersecurity Conference and Exposition. This presentation was originally recorded on December 8, 2011, from the Washington, D.C. Convention Center. Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. I think um, in, in keeping with uh, next steps, you might say, from the con uh, conversation we had with Mr. Henry this morning, we're going to focus on uh, some of the uh, steps being undertaken by foreign countries in the area of collaboration. Collaboration in the broadest sense of the term. Not only collaboration uh, with the, uh, uh, the Federal uh, Bureau of Investigation, but uh, I think an important element of this session is the collaboration that's going on among countries, uh, especially countries in the former Soviet Union who have experienced um, the sharp uh, point of offensive cyber operations. Uh, I'm very pleased to have uh, distinguished representatives from the Embassy of Georgia and the Embassy of Estonia. As many of you know, these two nations faced uh, the sharp point of, uh, of cyber attacks which had uh, uh, tremendous uh, uh, devastating effects on their nations and their populations. So with that, we will have uh, presentations by the two representatives from their government. Uh, we're going to try to afford as much opportunity uh, as we can for discussion uh, and asking you to please participate and uh, share us your questions and ideas that uh, uh, percolate uh, through the course of our discussion. Um, I, I'm very pleased to uh, be able to first introduce uh, His Excellency uh, David Rakiashvili. He's Deputy Chief of, of Mission for the Embassy of Georgia. Now, I must admit that uh, David and I um, have known one another for, for some time in a previous life and in, in, in other job lines out of the diplomatic corps. Um, uh, I've had uh, many years involvement in, the, uh, in Georgia from 1991 on, and uh, I'm very pleased to count uh, Dato as, uh, as a friend. He is now, um, uh, as, um, uh, as I said, he is the uh, deputy chief of mission. He's been a businessman. He's been a, um, a, a, a uh, involved in politics, uh, a man of great uh, depth, both from uh, a personal standpoint, a business standpoint, and, and a diplomatic standpoint. So with that, I'm very pleased to, uh, to introduce you to him. Thank you, Paul. Thank you so much. Um, it's a great honor and great pleasure, uh, particularly witnessing and confirming what you have just said about the uh, personal relations and your involvement in Georgia. It's been always great pleasure. Um, good morning, everybody. It's a great pleasure to be here. And the issue we are going to speak about has been, I believe, in a greater extent, a subject to concern to many of uh, those who are sitting and presented here. And uh, Georgia is one of those countries, probably the only country that has experienced what does it mean uh, to be attacked jointly by the conventional warfare and the cyber warfare. Uh, so I basically will tell you my personal story, uh, the, the story of Georgia, uh, which uh, in large extent is also my personal story, of back 2008. And there are very few facts uh, that are known to the public, uh, but I will just... Um, go through that. As I've said, the Georgia case was probably the first ever case that uh, the cyber warfare was used along with the conventional warfare. And um, during the Russia-Georgia war in 2008, uh, amongst the uh, conventional warfares, you would see that you know everything was deployed there. There was the ground, air forces, naval forces deployed. Uh, obviously, the propaganda uh, was there, but what came as a surprise attack uh, was the cyber attack. Um, after the, in the immediate aftermath of the war, there were several investigative and 
assessment teams uh, deployed to understand how it how it did work and I can share briefly uh, some of the observations uh, well the cyber attacks actually were prepared by or were perpetrated by the civilians um, most of those carried out the attacks were Russians but the uh, civilians of the other countries uh, then um, the organizers of the attacks had advance notice uh, on the Russian military attack against Georgia. And given the timing of the cyber attacks, the signal to go ahead with the attacks was probably sent before the media and general public were aware of the Russian military action. And many of the cyber attacks were so close in time to the corresponding military operations that there had to be a close cooperation between Russian militaries and the cyber attackers. Um, the cyber attacks began within uh, a few hours uh, after the military assault began and ended just a few hours after the military operation has been suspended. Uh, the first wave of attacks uh, was carried out by um, botnets and command and control systems that were ready before the Russian invasion. And these cyber attacks capabilities were associated with the Russian organized crime, uh, which aided and supported the attack efforts. Uh, the social networks were the main tool used to recruit those carrying out the attacks. Almost all of these internet networks and forums were in the Russian language. At least one of the website defacements that occurred during the cyber attacks against Georgia was prepared specifically for use against Georgia more than two years before the attacks. And uh, the images that were used in defacement were created on March 10th, 2006. Uh, this is according to the U.S. Cyber Consequences Unit. Uh, and interestingly, uh, interestingly, this image was not used anywhere else before, but just uh, was stored until it was used in the cyber campaign uh, in August 2008. And this is one of the indications suggesting that cyber attacks against Georgia had been on Russian agenda for some time. Um, the first targets for the cyber attacks were Georgian government and the news media websites. Uh, after the Russian military invasion into Georgia grew in scale, the cyber attacks expanded also to include many more governmental websites, more news media websites, financial institutions, uh, business associations, educational institutions, and a Georgian hacking forum as well. Um, the cyber attacks actually, um, as I've said, uh, it, it, it came at a surprise, and uh, that was not only a surprise to uh, the government uh, that, that, that was certainly monitoring the developments uh, in uh, previous weeks and months, but um, you probably can imagine uh, how much the society would be frightened and how much uh, the society would be lost in this space when the governmental or presidential website was shut down and you would see weird pictures on that website when the banks were attacked and actually they were limited over a week uh, to uh, carry out their financial transactions uh, and respectively to carry out their own duties. And uh, those attacks hindered communications also between the government and public and um, stopped payments and financial transactions. Um, so that was a very serious contribution into the general confusion of the society. Um, the channels of communication uh, in Georgia, like emails or call phones, cell phones, and landline phones, uh, phone calls uh, were seriously disrupted during the cyber campaign. The National Bank of Georgia was forced to uh, severe its internet connections for 10 days, and it, as I've said, stopped most of its financial transactions dependent on that institution. Um, that is actually briefly it. Um, it, as I've said, started just a few hours after the 
conventional military operation started and ended uh, also within a few hours after its accomplishment. Uh, what was the response of the government? Uh, certainly there were uh, two investigative groups working on the results and uh, trying to understand how all this were orchestrated, uh, what were the links between the militaries and the civilians, what was the link between the countries of, uh, that were housing those hackers. And uh, one thing was clear from the very beginning, what was neglected actually, that uh, uh, those attackers, they've uh, very largely used the social uh, media like Facebook and Twitter uh, to cooperate. And they have generated uh, thousands of uh, requests to, uh, to, to, to uh, open particular website which certainly caused uh, a disruption of the functioning of those web pages. Um, so uh, Georgia was the first country to, to realize that the results and to, uh, to, to be affected by the cyber attacks, uh, as I've said, in parallel to the conventional warfare. And it became clear that that's a part of the national security agenda, uh, which uh, was a game changer. Uh, we see that, you know, if you can have some conventional um, formats that prevent, um, or international organizations that prevent uh, escalation, that uh, limit uh, aggression, uh, and that's probably is a question that might be uh, debated, how effective are those, but at least you have some institutions and at least you have some formats that address those issues. In case of cyber attacks, we have witnessed that that was something, um, a wizard that uh, was extremely dangerous. So uh, Georgia is very much looking for backing up its uh, security in, other, in cooperation with other countries because considering our resources and considering our capabilities, Obviously, we are not uh, going to be secured unless we have a strong backups. And that's actually what we are now developing. I think that's uh, for the beginning remarks. Uh, and um, I'll be open for your questions. Thank you. Thank you very, thank you very much. Um, if I could ask you to, um, uh, could you mention the two, um, um, uh, give us the names of the two um, uh, entities that worked in Georgia was that was U.S. CERT and the Estonian CERT service. Right. Is that correct? Right. Very good. Correct. <clears throat> Thank you. I think that uh, is an important underlying point in showing the um, again international cooperation uh, between U.S. CERT and the Estonian CERT in helping the Georgians understand what happened and helping the Georgians protect uh, their assets for the future. Uh, our second speaker, it's great pleasure to introduce to you Christian Prick uh, from, um, uh, from the Embassy of Estonia. Uh, he has been working as defense counselor uh, to the embassy in Washington, D.C. since August uh, 2010. In his current uh, capacity, Christian uh, follows developments in defense and security matters, as well as deals with Estonian, U.S., Cooperation, Department of uh, Estonian Ministry of De Defense for the last three years. And, and with that, I welcome Christian and his remarks. Th thank you, Paul, uh, very much for this kind of introduction and uh, for moderating the panel. Uh, I would also like to thank uh, 1105 Media for organizing th this, uh, this event and uh, inviting me to, to speak. Now, uh, uh, the uh, the topic of this uh, this uh, this uh, panel is really sort of wide ranging, and uh, and probably any one of you ha uh, have their own personal stories or personal angles that that uh, you would uh, you would like to hear when uh, when talking about the uh, cooperation uh, uh, in. Cyber realm in general, or cooperation in uh, cy uh, cyber criminal inves investigations. I'm uh, I'm firstly uh, just describing briefly the let's say Estonian uh, background or why Estonia cares about uh, about cyber. 
and uh, and then I'm I'm moving forward uh, uh, by sort of uh, making the case why we think uh, cooperation is important. What are some of the impediments and uh, and uh, uh, what are the sort of areas where we have had some success? So uh, when uh, when people sometimes ask why Estonia cares about, about cyber or why Estonia uh, uh, is so often brought as the uh, sort of sample uh, of a country that, that uh, is very active in the cyber, uh, cyber security field, we first have to uh, bear in mind that, uh, that Estonia is a, an incredibly small country uh, with just uh, 1.3 million people. Uh, it's, it's crucial to have good connections between people. It's uh, it's good to uh, it's crucial to to make the government as effective as possible in order to be sustainable. Secondly, uh, uh, as one key background uh, aspect, uh, we have to keep in mind that uh, after the Soviet occupation ended in 1991, Estonia pretty much uh, uh, started from scratch as far as the uh, communication and uh, modern communication and information technologies were concerned. Uh, in the beginning of the 90s, I still remember the time when, uh, when I wanted to uh, call my, uh, my aunt, who lived uh, just uh, 60 miles away in another city. I had to uh, call to some call center, and then they might or might not have connected me in, uh, in half an hour or so. So this was the uh, sort of uh, starting point where we uh, uh, where we uh, were in, in the beginning of the 90s. So, but now when when you combine these uh, two aspects, an incredibly small country with, uh, with uh, no legacy system, so to say, uh, we get the environment which is very conducive uh, to rolling out and uh, really embracing a new. Uh, new, uh, modern, uh, and very sort of innovative uh, uh, communication and information technologies. So now this all brings a lot of benefits and, uh, and we certainly have been uh, uh, using, uh, using many, of, many of them. Uh, in Estonia there are an incredible number of uh, sort of public services that are uh, fully available online. It's not, a, it's not just that you, you go online and uh, check out what's the uh, uh, office hours of some uh, brick or motor uh, institution, but you actually conduct business with this uh, brick or motor uh, government in institution without ever uh, meeting a single person and without uh, ever uh, getting frustrated uh, waiting on the customer service line or something like that. Uh, se secondly, uh, public-private partnerships uh, have, have become not just uh, uh, slogans, but uh, have, uh, have sort of developed into an instinct. Uh, the the number the number of uh, services that uh, uh, initially have the sort of uh, government background, government of services. Or vice versa, the, the kind of services that, that uh, lead you to the uh, lead you to the uh, private sector companies, and that actually have the element uh, uh, in building up the sort of uh, uh, identification services, uh, the and the sort of web platforms for, for using that uh, in cooperation between the government and and uh, private sector is just in incredible. Uh, and and uh, with that, you also get the cooperation uh, when it comes to sort of security. Uh, thirdly, uh, also when it comes to uh, private sector, many companies that represent uh, the uh, kind of industries that otherwise uh, uh, are traditional, and uh, you you would think that they are you know in solid house brick brick and mortar house again, uh, have a huge staff, have never had that in Estonia. They started off in internet and stayed, and they stayed that that way. So, uh, 
the largest bank in Estonia, uh, and uh, in fact the largest bank in uh, the whole region, the Baltic states, uh, they have uh, estimated that if they were to lose their uh, sort of online banking advantage, or if they were to uh, go to the brick and mortar model, they would have to hire three times the personnel that they currently uh, employ. Um, now, and and people. This, this, this all ma uh, means that people have really uh, embraced the, as we call it, e-lifestyle. People really expect to have the access to free, wi free Wi-Fi pretty much anywhere you go in the country. People really expect to be able to, uh, to conduct their business uh, online. They expect to be able to uh, start up their business in uh, uh, 20 minutes uh, online. People are used to... Uh, voting on internet, uh, on national parliamentary elections without ev ever leaving, leaving their, uh, their home. Uh, people are accustomed to doing their taxi taxis uh, in 10 minutes uh, online. So, so that's, that's the reason why some call Estonia e-Estonia. Now, this all opens up, uh, as I said, a lot of benefits but it certainly opens up uh, uh, some vulnerabilities. And uh, when I'm saying that, I'm wholeheartedly not agreeing with those people who say, okay, gotcha, uh, there are vulnerabilities, so we shouldn't go that, uh, that way. The vulnerabilities are everywhere. The, the, no matter what kind of business model we have, no, no matter what kind of uh, government structure we have, there are vulnerabilities. But, uh, uh, but it's certain that in this, uh, also in Estonia, uh, the, uh, the rate or the number of uh, criminal acts that are either conducted uh, by, by using computers and or uh, uh, conducted against uh, the uh, communication uh, information uh, uh, systems has increased uh, considerably uh, over the last, uh, let's say, 10, 15 years. But uh, that's the kind of uh, uh, matter of life that we, rather than uh, uh, just whining about it, we, we rather uh, need to uh, do something with it. And, uh, and it's, and it's uh, clear that uh, uh, the cybercrime ha has a great potential to grow because it's uh, relatively in the, uh, independent uh, or not dependent of uh, the uh, physical uh, national borders and uh, and uh, the international cooperation when it comes to uh, fighting fighting uh, crime has always had had its caveats has always had its uh, had its problems so uh, cyber criminals have uh, definitely uh, taken advantage of it but so uh, we in Estonia we think we think that uh, in order to fight whatever uh, cyber uh, problems we face, we, uh, we need to take a very uh, integrated, open-minded approach, both, both domestically as well as, uh, as well as internationally. We cannot have it stovepiped, as you say, uh, here in the States. Uh, and uh, for for that reason, as we say in Estonia, that, uh, that uh, the whole of government, government approach when it comes to cyber is not enough. We, we have to have a whole, uh, whole of nation approach. We have to engage all the resources that we have. And for example, uh, when it comes to uh, uh, building up our cyber defense, one of the models that we have used is uh, so-called uh, Cyber Defense League in Estonia that uh, uh, has helped us to, to pool the talent uh, that we have on, on, on cyber on the, on the one roof on a voluntary basis. So we are, we are actually getting, getting the talent uh, working for not only the, for the government but for the entire society, uh, the, uh, the kind of uh, people that we would never be able to hire on a long-term uh, basis uh, by government. These people just need more action. They, they need uh, more money sometimes. But, but they are ready to do something on a voluntary basis. 
and, and uh, they benefit from uh, uh, great training. They benefit from uh, the networks that uh, the sort of building, building up the person-to-person -person networks, and they benefit from uh, uh, seeing what their colleagues in other sectors do. Their em uh, employers, they benefit from, uh, from uh, again, uh, having a more motivated wor workforce and a more qualified workforce. So it's uh, not just win-win situation, but I would say win-win-win situation. Now, uh, going to the international arena and uh, more specifically, specifically to uh, cybercrime, uh, our cooperation with uh, or our sort of extended and, uh, uh, and very focused uh, international cooperation uh, in fighting cybercrime started off in uh, the latter, latter half of the uh, 90s. And, uh, and the countries that, uh, that we have had uh, most cooperation with since then is uh, the United States, uh, Germany, uh, and also other, other countries uh, within the European Union, like uh, uh, some Nordic countries, uh, uh, UK, uh, others. But, but my, uh, but my uh, colleagues uh, from a capital assured me that, uh, that the country that uh, I should uh, certainly point out uh, as, as the one that, uh, that we have had uh, the deepest and best cooperation with is the U.S. and uh, mo mostly to uh, FBI. Now, and, and the reason for uh, that, that sort of helped to kick, kick start the, uh, kick start, uh, the uh, international cooperation uh, uh, on cyber crime field at least part of the reasons, was uh, quite awkward. In fact, the uh, Estonian banks were uh, quite advantaged uh, in, in their, or advanced in their uh, uh, online banking uh, solutions already back then in the uh, latter half of the uh, 90s. So what uh, we witnessed was that uh, some uh, people and organizations with uh, uh, bad intentions had uh, started to uh, use Estonia as sort of a des test bed and Estonian uh, uh, leading uh, leading uh, uh, companies in, in, that relied on networks as a sort of test bed to uh, to test out their uh, their uh, uh, newer methods and technologies to uh, to do harm to do to do bad things. Uh, to to steal money, uh, to uh, steal uh, credit card data, uh, do other things like that, and and uh, the the ultimate target normally was not Estonia. Estonia again is small. There is not that uh, uh, that much money, uh, but uh, but the technologies that uh, that uh, were considered uh, more advanced testing it, them out in Estonia were, uh, were then launched in other markets, so to say. So there was a very, very natural link between what happened in Estonia to uh, what happened in the rest of the world. And, uh, and the, the earlier you get uh, uh, your hands on something, uh, the better. So uh, the, and the international cooperation on the cyber crime field has been uh, very sort of multi-layered. Firstly, uh, of course, we, we do have the multilateral agreements. And uh, to this day, uh, despite uh, of, uh, uh, as I understand, uh, some, of, uh, some of the uh, uh, shortfalls of, of it, the so-called uh, 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 Council of Europe uh, Convention on Cybercrime is considered as a sort of a maybe not a gold standard, but at least something that, that uh, the principles of which uh, the responsible members of, uh, uh, of uh, uh, international community should endorse. And even though it's, it sounds very European uh, thing, it's actually uh, ratified by, by the US, it's ratified I think by Australia, many other countries outside of Europe. Uh, secondly, of course, uh, when we get more uh, specific, we need bilateral agreements. And, uh, and we are lucky to have them uh, with uh, uh, with key uh, key partners. 
and, uh, and we never can uh, uh, sort of forecast or es uh, estimate all uh, kind of uh, situations, all kind of uh, needs for assistance. So we, uh, from our side at least, we've tried to be as flexible as possible for an ad hoc uh, cooperation as, as well. Now, uh, uh, we certainly have had a uh, lot of success on the, uh, on the cyber uh, uh, cooperation front uh, when it comes to cr uh, criminal matters. Uh, most of this cooperation uh, uh, stays under, under the radar screen, but, uh, but there, are, uh, there are some uh, well-known, if not uh, notorious, uh, cases where uh, Estonia has uh, uh, been in the news uh, with stories that uh, certainly can be interpreted two ways. There are always people who see that the glass is half full, the others see that the uh, glass is half empty. So just uh, exactly, two, uh, exactly one month ago, uh, there was a major uh, conclusion of a major, major operation that was uh, conducted uh, in, cooperation, uh, uh, in cooperation between uh, the FBI here. Uh, I understand that some other uh, US government agencies were also uh, deeply involved, involved in it and the Estonian uh, police and Estonian border guard. Uh, the operation was uh, called Ghost Click, and, uh, and as far as I know, uh, it's considered the, uh, thus far uh, the largest uh, uh, criminal uh, case that, uh, that has uh, only sort of happened in the or has been conducted only uh, in, in cyberspace or using the, the cyber, uh, uh, cyber means. Uh, to, to this day, uh, the, the, our current knowledge is that, that this uh, group of people, around six people, uh, or exactly six people, uh, uh, according to our current knowledge, uh, was involved in, uh, in uh, stealing and uh, laundering uh, uh, the, the sum of around uh, 20 point, uh, 21 point five uh, uh, million dollars since uh, 2007. Again, uh, 21 uh, million dollars may not be a big money for U.S. Congress, for example, but uh, but uh, but f uh, for six people, uh, uh, it certainly is something. And. Uh, then also, in 2009, Estonian authorities were involved in uh, uh, breaking open or, 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 or solving the uh, uh, case uh, where uh, the Royal Ban Bank of Scotland's uh, subsidiary in the States, RBS WorldPay, the credit card operating uh, company, uh, was... Uh, was hacked into uh, and uh, and uh, was uh, the, the data of the uh, clients was uh, was uh, uh, stolen and used uh, for improper uh, purposes. Uh, and also, also we have had uh, in recent years some high-profile cases with, uh, uh, with 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 the Germans and uh, with the Brits, uh, with Finns, and some others. So. Uh, uh, whenever I ask my uh, uh, my colleagues in uh, in Estonia how good is their cooperation with uh, with the uh, American or other uh, international partners, to tell me that uh, it's it's very good. Even more importantly, Estonians are very modest. When I ask the same question from from Ameri Americans who know something about it, they say they say that the operation with Estonia. It's just terrific. It's it's better than uh, than uh, they've they've ever seen, or something like that. And now uh, I'm uh, uh, I'm rather leaving more time for questions if there there were were some, but I'm uh, maybe answering the uh, one question that some of uh, you may have. Uh, why is the person who bears the title of uh, defense counselor uh, talking about? Uh, uh, cyber crime here. There are two, 
two aspects to the answer that I would point out. Firstly, again, Estonia is a very small country. So, so is our, so is our, also our em embassy. We, uh, we have less than 10 diplomats working for our embassy, meaning that we, we try to be as universalist or know something about uh, almost everything. But uh, more importantly in that case, in Estonia we have uh, taken a very firm approach that uh, uh, when it comes to uh, cybersecurity, we cannot and we definitely should not uh, draw a very sort of strict line between the security and defense realms. Uh, because there is this gray area and there are possibilities for those two, two realms to, to merge. There are uh, organizations and capabilities that can be used for uh, criminal purposes, but uh, the next moment, just as uh, uh, David uh, mentioned, uh, mentioned before, can be used in situations which uh, have a very clear uh, and uh, grave national uh, uh, national security or defense purposes. Thank you. Thank you very much, Christian. Um, I think it's very important to note that um, uh, it's a, and I would like to underline the importance of the cooperation from the federal law enforcement of investigation and the Estonians because in this case, um, the Estonians have agreed to extradite these individuals to the United States. Uh, oftentimes, um, the case is that uh, local governments will take the um, uh, legal initiatives, but um, the closeness of the cooperation should be acknowledged and applauded. Um, with that said, I think that um, we have some, some, a good amount of time that we can devote to questions from our, for our panelists. So I would ask you to, um, to please stand up and identify yourself, and please come forward with your questions. Yes, please, in the back. Can you me? Yes. Christian, would you like to take the lead on the bilateral agreements between the United States and Estonia? Uh, yeah, uh, thank you. As I said, we can never predict all, uh, all kind of contingencies, all kind of situations that we, we may face. So, so there is uh, always a lot of room, room for sort of ad hoc uh, cooperation. But, uh, but uh, in terms of... Uh, uh, institutionalized or, uh, or pre-agreed uh, cooperation. Uh, we have, in Estonia, we have uh, the permanent presence of uh, not only FBI, uh, but also, uh, uh, but also uh, U.S. Secret Service, who both have role in, uh, in uh, investigating cyber crimes and cooperation with Estonia. And uh, for the cooperation of that, that intensity and depth we also uh, need to have and we have uh, like uh, exist, existing uh, permanent, permanent uh, agreements. But then again, uh, some, some issues are, are, are also covered by uh, like multilateral, uh, multilateral uh, uh, understandings and agreements uh, to uh, not only the uh, Council of Europe uh, convention that I mentioned, but also uh, to the uh, sort of standard uh, uh, work procedures and uh, cooperation procedures uh, through Interpol, uh, for example. So it, it is very multi-layered, and, uh, and I would say that uh, uh, creative mind never uh, 
uh, never stops because uh, there is a lack of uh, sort of uh, legal legal framework uh, for cooperation. David? Yep. Uh, thank you for the question. Um, uh, the United States and Georgia have, uh, since 2008, uh, the strategic charter, uh, since two, early 2009, the uh, strategic charter of, on partnership. And it covers four key areas, uh, including the security and defense. Uh, so far, this issue has been, as uh, Christian mentioned, um, discussed on an ad hoc basis. And uh, so far, this has not been um, discussed on the policy level uh, within the charter. But considering the importance, considering the uh, potential threat and uh, potential uh, scale of the uh, damage uh, that it might cause, uh, we certainly are looking forward to bring it to a higher level of the cooperation. Uh, besides that, I would uh, want to agree with Christian what he says. The critical thing here is how it is addressed in the international multilateral uh, forums. And we believe that uh, there is kind of a state responsibility that should be uh, on a table. Uh, and there are varieties of forms, be it a UN uh, charter or the International, um, uh, International Law Commission articles that should be applied to the cyberspace as well uh, with regards to the uh, state responsibility. Because as I've mentioned, um, it's a very tiny and sometimes a very vague link uh, between those who, call, who actually implement the attack, who conduct the attack, and uh, behind those uh, who have been orchestrating that. But unless you have addressed this in a multilateral forums, uh, obviously uh, this will be creating more appetite to use this force as the mean of achieving your political or whatsoever goals. Thank you. Thank you. If I could take the Chairman's prerogative, I'd like to follow up on, on something that um, uh, David made in his presentation about the use of social media um, uh, to activate um, individuals who engaged in attacks of various different Georgian websites. Um, the Nashi organization uh, within Russia uh, appeared to be active in that, and the group, uh, the Russian Business Network, a well-known uh, infamous cyber criminal organization was active in some of the scripting. Maybe you could uh, talk about some of the websites that were were uh, drafted uh, uh, and put up for the attack, which included, by the way, the U.S. Embassy in Tbilisi. Um, David? Yeah, thank you, Paul. Uh, in prior to all those, uh, the, 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 in the top of the list was obviously the uh, President uh, Saakashvili's website. Uh, then the varieties of uh, line ministries were attacked, including I, at that point, was working in the Ministry for Reintegration. Uh, and uh, we were one of these key agencies that was involved in the pre-war negotiations and <clears throat> also um, during the war negotiations. Uh, so we had to move to uh, a social media. We had to move to um, a private emails and private websites uh, in order to reach out the... Uh, partners and uh, reach out in general the uh, society and public. Uh, the uh, Ministry of Finance website was uh, targeted. Actually, uh, all key uh, uh, line ministries, including the Defense Ministry, including the Ministry of Internal Affairs, uh, the Ministry of Finance, the Ministry of Reintegration, and the uh, President's, uh, President's website were targeted. And the way how they did it uh, w was quite sophisticated. Obviously, I will fail to speak in the high technical details how did they do that. But uh, <clears throat> why it became so effective? Because those groups that, Paul, you have mentioned, <clears throat> they've engaged into those attacks, uh, stolen IP addresses. And they actually activated thousands of um, uh, thousands of computers around the globe without them obviously uh, being aware that they were engaged in requesting information from those uh, websites that I have been listing. So that was quite a sophisticated uh, approach and you cannot regard that the, uh, the way how it was uh, um, planned, the, the timing, uh, the uh, massive uh, scale of it and uh, the resources that were utilized uh, certainly led uh, to the conclusion that that was not kind of ad hoc reaction on uh, on on the war. Um, 
I think that that, that is um, briefly about. Thank you, David. Yes, Christian. Just, just as a sort of follow up on the same topic, uh, I I did not mention in my uh, uh, remarks uh, the the attacks that Estonia experienced in 2007, which were in some ways uh, uh, sort of pre just just uh, uh, training to pl uh, placing test, to trade test run test, well, run test test run for yeah that's that's put it that way for uh, for events in uh, Georgia in 2008 uh, in cyberspace only uh, and uh, and uh, some of the signatures uh, some of the methods and even some of the tools or that were used were were, were the same uh, only with the difference that uh, in 2008 uh, in Georgia. Uh, some of the weaknesses that they di uh, that they uh, discovered in their own systems uh, after 2007 in Estonia were uh, sort of uh, corrected, and the the the, uh, the attacks in, uh, in uh, Georgia were even more effective. Uh, but but the pattern was the same to to mostly uh, attack the attack the major media outlets. Uh, ma uh, major uh, or most important uh, government information websites and to, to attack the uh, bank systems, even though the uh, attacks were not uh, destructive but, but, uh, but uh, mainly disruptive, they were quite successful in one sense. Uh, in, uh, in nowadays world, uh, the statement that in information is power applies more than, more than ever. And uh, whether we admit it or not, uh, most of us we are information junkies. Particularly when, uh, uh, but particularly when you have a, a kind of crisis situ situation, when you take uh, away from people uh, the ability to get uh, adequate, uh, timely information, and you add on top of that uh, uh, the feeling that that maybe you cannot even uh, control your money just because the bank is under, under attack and uh, the online, uh, online banking is not working or something, then you create uh, a lot of, uh, lot of confusion, a lot of uncertainty, a lot of uncer uh, unsafe, uh, or uh, lack of safety uh, in the general society, and people don't like it uh, today. They may have uh, uh, not had any problem with uh, being without news uh, 100 years ago. Now they want news. Uh, every minute, uh, particularly when it's a crisis situation. <coughs> and one, one uh, comment on the uh, social media. Uh, social media, uh, in, th in that kind of uh, situations, in that kind of uh, sort of organizing that kind of attacks, can be used uh, both as the tool uh, in, in the hands of attackers, uh, as also a tool uh, in the uh, hands of the defensive side but uh, I would also point out that uh, it can be used as a quite, uh, quite, quite effective uh, smokescreen. And what we uh, uh, experienced in Estonia was that uh, uh, there was a lot of uh, sort of noise created in uh, uh, Russian language, uh, blogosphere, uh, uh, dif different, uh, and uh, dif different uh, kind of uh, social media outlets. And, uh, uh, with, with the aim of attacking Estonian uh, sites, with the aim of uh, uh, just uh, cursing Estonia, doing, doing things like that. But uh, behind those attack, uh, beh behind those uh, uh, symptoms, there were also more more sophisticated attacks that that uh, uh, did not leave any uh, any visible trail. Uh, in, in internet that uh, which uh, organizers never spoke up in internet or any, anything so uh, it's very easy to get confused in the internet when you when you have so much information coming in uh, and uh, there are the, the directions uh, you are uh, under attack from so many directions but uh, it's uh, it's important to focus on the most uh, ser serious attacks that's a very good point thank you very much gentlemen uh, in 2008, when I organized a panel uh, at the GovSec uh, 1105 Media on, uh, on the Georgian War and had the National Security Advisor here, 
the position that uh, the paper I delivered was on Russian information warfare doctrine, which goes back many years. But I think that this psychological warfare effect of uh, denial of service attacks, of people not being able to use cell phones because the cell phones were connected with debit cards and the banks had shut down, so now your cell phone is, is not working. It doesn't have to be a direct attack on the, on the cell carriers themselves. You have all sorts of things. Myself here in the United States trying to follow developments there in uh, Tbilisi during that time. Civil Georgia is a very popular and informative website. It was taken off the air. So uh, the, uh, the, 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 the psychological damage uh, as part of a military campaign to deny people knowledge about actually what is going on and then matching that with psychological operations starting rumors, et cetera, within the population and, 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 and trying to generate panic is something that is very real. Uh, next question. Yes, please. My name is Carice Flotilla, and I'm a Army National Guard. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I, I don't know if we're prepared to uh, answer that question. That's a very, that's a very uh, difficult and uh, probing one. But uh, it is clear, though, that, that states like Russia have refused to sign the uh, European uh, Convention. Um, and many, many of these states on, uh, have not gone forward with some of the international conventions to cooperate on cyber issues. But clearly, uh, uh, in many countries around the world, um, they are acquiring technologies to suppress open uh, discussion and an open free flow of ideas. Uh, but I think it's a little outside the scope of the, of, the, of the panel today, but I thank you for your concern. Yes, sir. Was it the Georgian he, government or military? He, no, he was asking, was, uh, the question is, uh, during the Georgian war, was it the Georgian government that shut down the banks or was it the, the banks? I, or the military, okay. Central Bank. Uh, well, the, the, well, that was not a political decision of uh, the government to shut down the banks. Uh, due to the cyber attacks, they started malfunctioning their websites, their cyberspace started malfunctioning. It was not uh, either political decision or a decision to respond to uh, the malfunctionings. What I was describing that is the, the uh, massive attacks caused uh, disruption uh, of uh, varieties of institutions, of functioning of the varieties of institutions. And those who heavily would depend on the cyberspace were affected most. 
if I'm mm -hmm. ask, answering your question, I'm not sure because uh, I, I might be able to help I, on I that. I cannot yeah. recall uh, whether there was kind of a military or government of Georgia. A actually, um, I, I can help on that, David. Um, uh, the, the largest shutdown of the banks in Georgia were related to actions taken by the international financial institution that was concerned about this um, spreading outside the borders of Georgia. So there were ta steps taken by the international community to, to uh, basically uh, put a barrier about transfers of money going out. But internally in Georgia, there was just shutdown of, of, of the banks because of DDoS attacks and other types of, of manipulations that were going on in their institutions. And one of the questions that happened after the war is, was there anything left behind in Georgian financial institutions by others who may have operated under the cover of the noise that Christian talked about? Because you know, when you employ social media and get individuals, hacktivists, or in the case of George, uh, Russia, Nashi, or which means our, um, you you create a great deni uh, 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 deniability, and you generate a lot of buzz. And as Christian says, there's there's other more insidious activities going on underneath, and I think that was discovered in both their, their countries' cases. I, I think I saw another hand back there. Yes, sir. Could you identify yourself, please? Question is: uh, During during these um, uh, conflicts, was there any attacks on 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 uh, utility networks uh, and telephones? Yes, Kristin. Uh, in Estonia, uh, there were no attacks against the utility, utilities per se, but uh, but we had some uh, uh, rather sophisticated attacks. Uh, now I hope I, I get at, at least part of the sentence uh, or the term right uh, at the root server level uh, at ISPs. And uh, and uh, and now now uh, uh, now it comes to play that that uh, uh, the services that ISPs offer to uh, to different uh, uh, players in the society are not just uh, for uh, uh, are not just uh, giving the ability to to read your newspaper or get your news, but 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 also. Uh, there are other other uh, companies that uh, that uh, rely on that and and route their traffic through internet, uh, for example. So, so there were some risks, sort of indirectly, but uh, but uh, luckily nothing serious happened in Estonia. David. And in case of Georgia, um, again, that was a combination of the conventional warfare and the cyber attacks, and largely, most effectively, the uh, conventional warfare would cover damaging and harming the key critical infrastructure of the country. And I believe that also is due to probably the fact that not all of the critical infrastructure was uh, very, very much kind of electronized. And uh, wherever they would have an access, they did uh, attempt to harm it. Well, with that, I think our time, uh, unfortunately, has come to an end. I want to uh, ask everyone to join us in a round of applause for our distinguished guests today.